One of my favorite antidotes to share at cocktail parties, board game parties, whatever I do, is that people are absolutely terrified of the 1971 movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Even to this day, they are. When you ask them why, most people will say it's because they can't handle something that violent, someone being mutilated with a chainsaw or something along those lines. Yet, that barely happens in the movie. Seriously, there's a notable lack of violence given the title and the infamy surrounding this film. So why is that? A lot of it's due to clever filmmaking, clever marketing, but most significantly for us here, I think it is the presence of a deeply rooted cultural mythos that I think we can argue focuses around some unaddressed, unspoken trauma in American popular discourse. Welcome to Analysis with Alex. I'm your host, Alex. This is a YouTube channel that aims to provide you with lengthy video essay explorations in the form of units to provide you a more rich exploration into certain topics that you might be used to. This video is a part of a series titled The Terror of Trauma, which explores horror films that deal with the theme of trauma in some kind of manner. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to go back and watch my video over 2019's The Lighthouse, as I'm going to be making some references to it in this video here. Also, it helps if you've seen the film before I talk about it here, so seek it out however you'd like. So see The Texas Chainsaw Massacre before you watch this, it will make a lot more sense. Also, all the references that I used throughout the video here, I will have some more information on how to get to those in the description below so you can have some further reading if you want that as well. Though I could certainly make a lengthy exploration of how Toby Hooper's film helped inform one of the most influential horror subgenres of all time, the slasher film, or about how there are just so many questionable choices of the characters here, like why would you scream relentlessly in the pitch dark if someone is chasing you, why wouldn't you just hide somewhere? This video will not be that. Those topics have been covered a fair amount of times, though perhaps we will cover the slasher genre as a unit one day. I want to make the case that we can see this film engaging with trauma in a multitude of ways through viewing it as a cultural product of its time, but also how it is able to tap into the unease and uncomfortable nature of addressing people groups and locations of trauma. Perhaps a great place to start exploring how this movie deals with trauma would be the opening itself. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre wants you to believe it was based on real events. That was a significant part of its marketing strategy. Though the rest of the film doesn't evoke realism in as direct of a manner as it does here, this moment taps into how typically traumatic events and landscapes are explored by the American public through the news media. Pay attention to certain words used here to heighten what context the viewer is provided with here, pulling on some of the diction present in broadcast news. Words and phrases like an account of the tragedy which befell, or the events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. This kind of language could easily be pulled from a rather sensational news report. Perhaps this is an indictment of sorts on the broadcast media's framing of traumatic events as voyeuristic experiences for others not involved to enjoy. Another choice to continue to evoke the broadcast media occurs with the following shots of a camera taking flash photos of a corpse, simulating the flashes of a paparazzi camera onto specifically a site of trauma. This idea of using news media to evoke a realistic sense of trauma continues through the use of radio news clips as they play underneath the revealing of the corpse statue and even the entire duration of the opening credits. The audio here continues to invoke the sense that this is dealing with real trauma as it then seems to become a diegetic sound when we are greeted with our gang of hippies. As these traumatic events are being relayed to everyone in the van, we are greeted with our first image of the Texas landscape. It visually shows this is a landscape so brutal there are just corpses everywhere, both animal and human. 
The inclusion of broadcast media is certainly one tactic that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre employs to evoke real-world trauma into its narrative, but this moment gets us towards another significant way that this movie is able to tap into an American cultural trauma, which I think lends itself to the legacy that has helped this film endure over all this time. As I mentioned in our exploration of The Lighthouse, landscape and setting can become a useful tool to evoke the theme of trauma. As Ryan Hollinger points out in his video essay over the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the landscape is starkly barren, desolate, wide, and empty. The only few buildings present are all dilapidated, broken down, or being overrun by nature, which is framed in a more creepy and eerie manner rather than something romantic. Landscapes like this, in fact, exist throughout a lot of the Midwestern United States as well as the South Midwestern part of the United States. I speak somewhat from experience as I had been living out in West Texas for about two years, but also the reception to this film from the notably New York and LA-centered intellectual crowd gets at the idea that Hooper and his crew utilized iconography of American suffering that tends to get contorted into an arena that is somewhat uneasy for many to discuss, especially given that this was produced in a time period where American exceptionalism was beginning to have some holes poked through it. If you have the time, I would highly suggest reading over John Bloom's exploration of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and its production that was published in Texas Monthly in November 2004. Not only is this article incredibly dense, highly detailed, and well-researched, it's written by John Bloom, who is actually Joe Bob Briggs of drive-in, low-budget, horror critic fame. Despite some surrounding controversies on other things that he has said, you can look into those if you want to, he would be a useful resource, and a lot of the information and analysis present in this article is highly useful to assist in your betterment of cultural analytical skills. In the section titled The New York Intellectual Massacre, Bloom outlines how the film was typically praised by film critics and intellectuals of the time, not all, but by many of them. But more importantly for our exploration of how trauma is presented in this movie is how he points to the specific use of Texas and how it set off a certain reaction in these critics. Quote, The idea that the story could take place only in Texas informed a lot of the more hysterical articles ignoring the fact that the principal source material was from medieval German folklore and a Wisconsin court archive. If you read enough of the reviews, in fact, you might start to think that the scariest word in the title was neither Chainsaw nor Massacre, but Texas." End quote. Bloom continues to explore this reaction through popular film theorist Mary McKee, and how she points how the use of Texas for this film already signifies it as a broken, violent landscape given its history in popular American culture as the site in which the cowboy ideology exist. Violence is often framed as necessary in these stories that spawn from this ideology, as well as almost entirely perpetuated by men. Though there are exceptions to this, especially now due to the revisionist western films, it was certainly the way many audience members would have understood Texas at the time. And this begins to point us in the direction of another way this film evokes trauma, the characters that are present in this rural, barren Texas landscape. Though the main characters, the hippie yuppie kind of characters, never state where they are from, you know they are not really from around here, even if some of them grew up there. Noticeably, they are very modern compared to the locals presented here, hence why this film is often seen as dealing with generational tensions in post-Vietnam America. John Bloom summarizes his reading well when he states that, quote, Chainsaw was the first baby boomer horror film in which pampered but idealistic suburban children, distrustful over anyone over 30, are terrorized by the deformed adult world that dwells on the grungy side of the railroad tracks. This tension is tied to the landscape as we've been exploring, especially given the depression era style house a lot of the film occurs in and other props that refer to times long gone, 
such as the collection of cars in front of the family's house and the notable lack of electricity. In another strange connection to our exploration of the lighthouse, Texas Chainsaw Massacre also has an image of time being destroyed. As Kirk and Pam approach the house, among the items hanging from trees is a stopwatch with a nail driven through it. Once again, a horror film that explores trauma in some capacity signifies trauma's ability to contort time for someone. Hooper and his crew place this symbol here to let the viewer know, time doesn't matter here. This place is frozen in time. This furthers the reading of the generational tensions present in American culture at the time as manifesting themselves in this film. This tension occurs between the idealistic New Age hippies and the rural labor force population of cannibals. It's in these characters that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is able to invoke a sense of cultural trauma yet again. The family of cannibals are not entirely spawned out of fiction. They have a background in rural American labor. They are displaced by technological progression stuck in a landscape that lacks qualities of growth and fertility. And not all these individuals are evil cannibals. They still find themselves caught in attention though, caught in a large scale cultural anxiety. Their trauma is often laughed at, looked down upon by people like the group of hippies present in the film. In an interesting manner, Franklin becomes a way for us to understand these other characters present in that graveyard scene. Though he is along for the ride with Sally and the gang, Franklin is somewhat noticeably more Texan, I guess you could say, than the rest of them. His clothing is more conservative, he has a bit of a stronger southern drawl to him, and he holds rather extensive knowledge on the region around them. This is revealed in a strange moment as the rest of the group play around in the old house. Franklin is stuck outside, and he seems to align with the rural southerners in this moment. He is isolated and alone. He is abandoned by modern society as symbolized through our youthful protagonist. He is crippled, though the rural southerners are economically crippled, not physically necessarily, and he grows somewhat resentful towards them. The idea that these rural characters are resentful towards these more urban elite characters is never directly stated in the film, but because Texas Chainsaw Massacre's use of iconography and the visual form, it was something that more moviegoers and critics of the time felt the film was exploring. This idea that this movie explores the trauma occurring in the declining American rural south is even further solidified when looking at the slew of remakes that occur in the early 2000s. Scholar Craig Frost points to the notable shift of giving more attention to the murderous cannibalistic family in the remakes as opposed to the original film's use of iconographic southerners to generate its tension and motivation. Quote, Feeding into the issue of how the film and narratives are received by audiences, Hooper's film was understood to display the cultural anxiety surrounding post-Vietnam America, a theme that is completely excluded within the initial remake. However, the issue of political implications emerges in the prequel to Lesbomans, that's the director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning recycles Hooper's subtext through the direct integration of themes involving the unease of America's involvement in Vietnam and the decline of rural America. Failing to capitalize on the original post-Vietnam cultural climate from which Hooper's film emerged, this induction of subtext functions primarily as narrative fodder, restricting character engagement for a contemporary audience. As Fegberg discusses, the political and cultural aura associated with the original text appears to have disappeared in relation to the remake and prequel. In Hooper's film, these characters are clearly coded as being one with the region they are in, which the film already established as a site of trauma. We know that they are through their use of their wardrobe, the thick accents they have, and even the defamiliarized, another topic from our lighthouse exploration, traditional family dinner present toward the end of the film. Our two different groups of characters couldn't be even further apart from one another. 
One is idealistic, colorful, perhaps entirely unaware of the trauma that they are traveling through. Actually, it is often framed as a hindrance or an annoyance to them. The other is drab, dirty, crazed, and violent from existing in this traumatic landscape for as long as they have, which feels like it might be since it was ever even first formed. Through the use of iconography in both the landscape and these characters, compounded by the use of realistic news media framing, Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre displays a highly effective film that it can explore real life cultural trauma without ever having to directly state that it is doing so. Sometimes the visuals, the picture alone is worth a thousand words. Thank you so much for continuing this exploration of horror cinema and themes involving trauma with me. Please let me know what you thought of this video in the comments, and please, if you are interested in using this channel as an educational research, then go ahead and subscribe to it so that you can continue to experience a more rich exploration of this genre and its relatively popular theme of trauma. Now, I am currently in the middle of trying to find a job and moving, so videos may continue to be sporadic for a period of time, but they will continue to be published. Once again, thank you for your time, and I will see all of you during our next exploration.